Welcome to the cutting edge of cardiovascular sciences at DeBakey CV Education. I'm your host, Professor John Cook at uh, Houston Methodist Research Institute, and I'm joined by Dr. Jacques O'Hayen, who's visiting us from France uh, at the uh, Savoy Mont Blanc in Grenoble, France, and also our own Dr. Natou Lay, who's an associate professor of medicine in our Department of Cardiovascular Sciences. Today, we're going to talk about the major cause of death and disability in this country and the world, and that is vascular disease, and primarily atherosclerosis. That's what we'll be talking about today. And in the second segment, we'll be talking about vascular aging. What makes us age? What are the hallmarks of aging? And applied to the vasculature because aging is the major cause of uh, major determinant of vascular disease, vascular aging. So um, why are we talking about this? Well, um, vascular disease and atherosclerosis causes heart attack and stroke, um, major causes of morbidity and mortality. And it causes other disorders as well. You have peripheral arterial disease, people aren't able to walk as they would like to because of peripheral arterial disease. That's a very common condition in this country. Uh, almost as many people with peripheral arterial disease as with coronary artery disease, but it's often not recognized. Aortic aneurysms are another cause of vascular disease. And uh, the list goes on. But today we're going to be primarily focused on atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease and carotid artery disease because uh, my uh, visiting scientists here have uh, a lot of ex expertise in that. Um, Dr. Natule, let's talk a little bit about what causes atherosclerosis, this disease that results in heart attack and stroke. Yes, so atherosclerosis is a multiple factorial disease. So if to talk about the risk factor, we can uh, think about uh, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, smoking, unhealthy diet, no exercise, and another very important that is an independent risk factor of atherosclerosis we, uh, we should count is aging. You know that accumulation of senescence and cell is the causative factor of um, atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. So that's, that's the, the traditional risk factors that we think of when, when we're thinking of uh, what puts you at risk for having a heart attack, what puts you at risk for having a stroke, are the ones you just mentioned. High cholesterol, diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, sedentary state, um, you know, poor diet. Um, how are all these disparate factors causing this one condition called atherosclerosis? What, you know, how, how do they do that? How do these risk factors cause atherosclerosis? Well, um, it is know that atherosclerosis begins with the damage in endothelial cell. So this cell is the cell that lies between the bloodstream and the inner arterial walls. Mm -hmm. So this cell is very critical because it controls the passes, not only oxygen, nutrient, but also many substance um, and immune cell cross the cell membrane to the tissue. Mm -hmm. So the endothelium is this layer of cells uh, that lines the blood vessel. Yes. And uh, from what you just said, it sounds as though it exerts tremendous control over vessel tone, vessel structure, and interaction uh, of the vessel wall with circulating blood elements. Um, this endothelium, it sounds like it's uh, the, like the Teflon coating of the blood yes. vessel. So what goes wrong? What, what happens to this, this tissue that uh, protects our vessels? So um, many reasons it can be damaged, right? For example, um, the, let's say smoking, the chemical, or the accumulation of cholesterol, mm -hmm. that also cause damage of this endothelial cell. Mm -hmm. And of course, if the cell is healthy, we are healthy. Mm -hmm. If the cell becomes damaged mm -hmm. uh, and we get sick, mm -hmm. right? So start by endothelial cell damage and then any material that flow in the bloodstream, for example, cholesterol, fat, calcium, a wasted product, they accumulated at the damaged side of endothelial cell. Mm -hmm. 
this accumulation trigger reaction, chemical reaction that oxidize cholesterol and then become the inflammatory particles. So this uh, inflammation uh, start to initiate so-called inflammatory response. So at the time, endothelial cell become activated and start to secrete adhesion molecule. Mm. So in the blood vessel, there are also other cell type, vascular smooth muscle cell also secrete chemokine, chemoattractant, all of which attract the white blood cell, mm -hmm. we call monocyte, rolling to the site of damage. Mm -hmm. right? At the site of damage, oxidized cholesterol activate monocyte to be converted to macrophage. Mm -hmm. And macrophage is the cell that can eat and digest oxidized cholesterol mm -hmm. to become foam cell. Mm -hmm. Accumulation of foam cell form the plaque. Mm -hmm. And over time, plaque is increased inside. Mm -hmm. So this and process starts with a dysfunction of the endothelium. The endothelium um, is altered by high cholesterol, yes. high blood pressure, diabetes, and you said it begins to make molecules, adhesion molecules, that allow the monocytes to stick yes. and enter into the vessel wall. And there, uh, they start to absorb oxidized cholesterol and other uh, glycosylation products uh, yes. that uh, lead to the formation of these foam cells. And I guess the collection of these foam cells form the first grossly visible lesion of atherosclerosis, the fatty streak. Right, and this process takes very long time. Mm -hmm. So usually this happens as early as childhood and in very slowly, silently, with no symptom until middle age or older because you know the accumulation of plaque takes time. Mm -hmm. So, and also at the same time, vascular smooth muscle cells begin to uh, proliferate and many of them start to migrate to the black side and try to cover the black. Mm -hmm. They form so-called fibrosis, fibrosis cap. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, let's say under sheer stress, and then this black will be ruptured, mm -hmm. release the black content inside. Mm -hmm. At that moment, the black can go downstream of the blood vessel and it contribute to the formation of uh, blood clot or thrombi mm -hmm. and that way you know we have a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, that progression from uh, altered endothelium, dysfunctional endothelium becoming less like Teflon, more like Velcro, yes. that starts the process. The monocytes get in, they become foam cells, they accumulate, form these fatty streaks, the plaque grows and at some point you have a, a plaque that is uh, has fibrous cap and uh, a necrotic core this and it's that uh, necrotic core can, can cause, uh, this can is cause the problem ultimately if it ruptures and, and uh, causes thrombosis. This is correct, John. In fact, we can add a few things. Um, in terms of biomechanics, uh, the stress is responsible for this black rupture, the peak cap stress. When you have a huge necrotic core on a very thin cap, there is a huge amount of stress at the level of the thin cap. And th this stress is responsible for the rupture of the, of mm -hmm. the black which mainly, for sure, there is some older biologic process as degradation, or the factor which may affect the rupture, but one of, at this stage of the disease, the stress is, res is mainly responsible of this rupture. Mm -hmm. yes. And the, the rupture causes the release of the of necrotic core, core in the blood. And, and that causes a blood clot to form. Right correct. There. Um, so what, what are the determinants of, of stress? That ca what, what causes this rupture? In fact, the stress depend of, uh, depend of the morphology of the plaque, uh, the size of the necrotic core, the, the amplitude of, the, the, of this thickness, the, the, the cap thickness, and also the mechanical properties of this constituent of the plaque. If, let's say very briefly, if you have a huge gradient of stiffness between necrotic core and fibrosis around uh, the, the, the necrotic core, then you will have a huge cap, peak cap stress. Mm -hmm. More the gradient is important, more will be the, the amplitude of the, the peak cap stress responsible for the rupture. Mm -hmm. okay. This is why it's important today in biomechanics to characterize not only the morphology of the plaque, but also the mechani their mechanical properties to have a go very good act, precision of 
of the prediction of rupture of the plaque. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular place where the plaques rupture? Usually, uh, it's well accepted, and we also prove and show uh, clinically uh, that the, as soon as your cap thickness is smaller than 100 micron, then the rupture is, is the, the, the risk of rupture is, is important. Uh, usually, it's at, at the middle of the of the thin cap. Mm -hmm. on, on the on the degradation, the inflammatory process occur at the sh at the shoulder of the of the necrotic core. Mm -hmm. So the, the the thinness of that fibrous cap is a predictor for rupture. This is is, there, can, is there some way a clinician can oh. can measure the the thickness of the plaque in in the vessel wall? Yes, uh, they use let's say the, the, by the imaging technique intravascular ultrasound cor coronary, they are able to get this precision of 100 micron. Hmm. Then they use it mm -hmm. to predict the risk of rupture of the, of the, of the lesion. So intravascular ultrasound is good at de detecting this, uh, the thickness Correct. of the plaque. Um, are there any non-invasive tools that we have to assess the plaque thickness, the, uh, the cap thickness? For the coronary, not yet. I will say MRI does a lot of progress. We will be there be very soon, but not yet. Uh, this is why we are still doing intravascular ultrasound f to characterize the coronary. But for big artery, after carotid, then uh, we can MRI is very useful. Mm -hmm. We can we can see the same phenomenon mm -hmm. in by using this n not not other of imaging technique. Mm -hmm. And I guess in, in that case, if it, you could potentially uh, operate on a, on a patient that has uh, a vulnerable plaque based on the characteristics. Or would that be a reasonable approach? Yes, they use that to, to predict the rupture or to see if the, if the disease need to, to be stunted or to, they need to, to, mm -hmm. to do something in terms of the, of the <coughs> therapy. Mm -hmm. But they don't use it to... Uh, uh, f to bec because as soon as a patient is <coughs> in medical care, he has some statin, he has some drug, then even if you have the rupture of the plaque, nothing will happen because the coagulation will be avoided by this statin drug. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, tell, us, tell us also about what other things we can learn from non-invasive <coughs> imaging. You've done a lot of work on magnetic resonance imaging. I, at some point you were at National Institutes of Health working with our own uh, Dr. Rod Pettigrew, who's uh, directing our NMET program here at Houston Methodist now. He was at the time the uh, <coughs> director of the NIBIB, the National Institute for Bioimaging and Bioengineering. Yes. You work with him. Oh, yes. Tell us about that work that you did with, with uh, Rod Pettigrew at the uh, NIH. When it was at NIH in, for my sabbatical in 2008, we, uh, we uh, start a program, a clinical research program with Dr. Pettigrew. Uh, uh, we had an hypothesis. The hypothesis was very simple. The coronary, the bifur coronary bifurcation, uh, rest uh, rest on the on the on the epicardium, mm -hmm. and the motion of the heart is so strong. It's a muscle. You have a lot of contraction, actual contraction, twist, and radial expansion during the, the cardiac cycle. And that affects the blood vessel. And that affects the blood vessel. Correct. And the, the hypothesis with Roderick Petit was to say, how does this motion of the heart? Which is also imposed to, imposed to the coronary bifurcation could be responsible for the initiation of atherosclerosis. Hmm. And uh, then the, the question is: uh, Does this motion affect the mechanical properties of the arterial wall? The wall stiffness is crucial; it's essential to the, to characterize, to predict the location of atherosclerosis. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea. Uh, we can ask why the motion of the heart could modify the mechanical properties of the artery. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's just what we call this phenomena in physics, it's called nonlinear continuum mechanics. It's, it's uh, more you stretch a tissue, more this tissue becomes stiffer. Mm -hmm. That means maybe the, the hypothesis was maybe the motion of the heart affects the stretch of the at different location of the bifurcate, coronary bifurcation differently, and um, you may have a pattern of stiffness inside the wall that may affect the response of the endothelial cells. Uh -huh. And we did that, we, we did a study on, with 10 patients with Dr. Pettigrew at uh, NIH, uh, and we, uh, for these 10 patients, we 
the stent patient had a CT to reconstruct the coronary bifurcation. They had also an MRI to, to track the motion of the heart. And we used a biomechanical model to predict the location of the atherosclerosis. And what we found, we found we did two kinds of simulation, fluid mechanics, then we saw that some low shear stress area, recirculation area were also responsible for the plaque location. Mm -hmm. But more interesting, we found that some area of the wall were stiffer than the other. And this area where was the location of the plaque was. That's interesting. Let's talk about that for just a minute. So typically plaque does form at bends, branches, and bifurcations of blood vessels. And so so some of it is at least in the coronary arteries is due to this phenomenon that you described. The the, the heart is moving and it's uh, altering the the stiffness of the uh, coronary arteries. But what about uh, in general, bends, branches, and bifurcations? What what's going on there, Dr. Natulea? You've done some work in this yes, area. Yes, so the blood vessel need to feed uh, the whole body, mm -hmm. not a nu nutri nutrients and oxygen. So to do that, they need to branch out, mm -hmm. right? So and the problem is at the bifurcation area, as you just discussed, or the curvature. So all way the blood flow is slow down we call that is disturbed flow. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, in the last several decades, many study going on mm -hmm. to understand why the plaque is majorly formed at that disturbed flow area. When you say uh, disturbed flow, what, what do you mean by that? At a, at a so bend branch of bifurcation, you have this disturbed flow. What does that mean? So the, the blood flow j just get the branching point and they start to become turbulent and stop and you know slow down mm -hmm. as as you know may i, I, I have, will have to add a few comments you're totally right correct dr lee in fact uh, what's happened at the level of the bifurcation regarding the flow is that there is some area where the where you have some recirculation it's like looking a river wh where the river has a, a, a branch and, and uh, down the, the branch you have immediately after the branch you have some area of recirculation of accumulation this area of accumulation are exactly the, where you have a recirculation, low shear stress. This is exactly where the plaque start, the initiation of the atherosclerosis begin uh, there in this location. Yes, so it could be the friction force on the uh, of the blood flow on the endothelial cell, mm -hmm. right? So it fast and slow that make the damage of endothelial cell, mm -hmm. as we discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. And actually, in the last ten years, I also mainly focus on understanding what is the mechanism underlying that so-called disturbed flow induced plaque formation. And we found the activation of a kinase that belong to MAP kinase family member mm -hmm. rapidly activated under disturbed flow condition. Mm -hmm. start to phosphorylate downstream event and regulate the transcriptional factor go to the nucleus start to you know turn on turn off um, gene expression reduce the pro-inflammatory gene expression increase pro-inflammatory mm -hmm. gene expression reduce the the anti-inflammatory gene expression. So the endothelial so cells can sense this yes. disturbed flow, this recirculation, and uh, it alters the signaling within the cell, is, is what you're saying, yes. and, and leading yes. to uh, the activation of transcription factors, proteins that affect gene expression, yes. and in this case, inflammatory gene expression. Yes, so that, you know, that sensing is kind of mechanical, mechanical sensor and transformed to biological, uh, you know, trans transduction signal and affected the downstream event. Of course, you know, the redoubt will be increased cell apoptosis, cell senescence, increased VCAM1, ICAM1, NF kappa B, so on and so forth. And then, you know, cause the black formation. And you mentioned uh, cell senescence can be induced by this disturbed flow. We're, we're going to be taking a break in just a minute, but we're going to get back to senescence and vascular aging uh, in the next segment. Uh, we'll be joined by some of our junior scientists who are doing some exciting work in this area on vascular aging. Um, so um, I'm John Cook. Uh, you're at the cutting edge of cardiovascular sciences, and uh, we'll be back in a moment uh, after this break. So. The transition from medical student to being a vascular surgery 
intern and resident is can be fairly traumatic. Part of this is to really smooth that way forward. And so we're kind of trying to take it down to what are the basics that will make this transition a little bit easier for medical student into vascular intern. For me, being here for pre-intern boot camp is all about just making sure I was ready to start residency with like right foot forward, getting ready to go, going through all these courses about like anatomy and anatomical exposures, things we might like encounter during first year. Just make sure we're like ready to hit the floor running. Outside of doing medical school rotations, this is a little bit more of a different experience because it, it gives you an opportunity to see what it's like as closely simulated as possible to what it's really going to be like. So it's a grand opportunity for you to really come and see what vascular surgery is about. Practice. Practice makes perfect and this is a great environment for that and it's, you know, the people make it a great environment. It's cool that we have all this awesome stuff to work with, but uh, definitely the residents, the fellows, the attendings, uh, those personalities are what actually make it um, a great place to learn. Hello, I'm Dr. Deepan Shaw from the Houston Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. I'd like to invite you to join us for the upcoming DeBakey CMR workshop. This five-day cardiac MRI training course will be held May 4th to the 8th, 2020 at the Houston Methodist Hospital in the Texas Medical Center. This workshop covers practical applications of cardiovascular MRI with a mix of hands-on and lecture sessions. It's a one-of-a-kind opportunity to build practical knowledge in such topics as basic MRI principles, cardiac anatomy, late gadolinium enhancement, stress perfusion imaging, vascular imaging, case interpretation, and troubleshooting of image acquisition. We use a case-based approach and you can expect to review up to 50 clinical CMR cases during the week. The workshop is designed for cardiologists and radiologists and technologists. The workshop is built around small group learning to make sure that each learner gets individual attention. Space is limited, so please be sure to sign up early. I hope you'll join us for this conference and look forward to seeing you in May. It's a perfect time of the year to visit Houston. To learn more and register, please visit our website. Hello, I'm Dr. Alpesha from the Houston Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. I'd like to invite you to join us in Houston, Texas for the fourth annual Cardiology for the Non-Cardiologist Conference. This special event will be held on June 27, 2020 at the Houston Methodist Research Institute in the Texas Medical Center. This one-day conference teaches non-cardiovascular physicians and healthcare providers to identify common risk factors, guidelines, and treatment approaches for cardiovascular diseases. You'll learn about the latest medical and surgical therapies for heart disease and advances in managing common clinical cardiovascular conditions. Our expert faculty will also discuss the clinical challenges often associated with caring for patients with heart disease. The course is designed for physicians, mid-levels, and nurses specializing in cardiology, internal medicine, primary care, family practice, critical care, and emergency medicine. We also encourage residents and fellows in training to attend, as well as physical therapists, radiology technologists, and sonographers. I hope you'll join us and look forward to seeing you in June. Thank you.
cardiology for the non-cardiologist. This is a, a unique photo. Within one day, you can get really a capsule who is the latest in cardiovascular medicine. This is aimed at all the people that interact with the cardiovascular field. Uh, there may be primary care physicians, there may be nurse, nurse practitioners, allied health professionals, obstetrics and gynecologists, ophthalmologists, and that's what we've seen in this conference is the breadth of people that interact with cardiovascular disease and interact with the cardiologists. ER nurse by background, your heart is important. Um, it affects every single patient that we see uh, and we treat and we care for. I love cardiology. It's something that interests me and I wanted to learn more. Obviously, cardiology is advancing every year and new treatment options are available. So it's good for me to keep up to date with the information that's being introduced uh, in the cardiology field and it allows me to help my patients. Welcome back to the cutting edge of cardiovascular sciences here at the Bakey CV Education. I'm your host, John Cook. I'm professor and chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences here at Houston Methodist Research Institute. And I'm joined by uh, some of the scientists that are working with me at the Department of Cardiovascular Science. Uh, we've got our visiting professor, uh, Jacques O'Hayen, who's from the Savoy Mont Blanc at Grenoble, uh, France. And we've got uh, uh, Brandon Walter, who's an MD, PhD student at Texas A&M, who's uh, working in our Center for Cardiovascular Regeneration. And you already heard from Dr. Natu Lay, our associate professor uh, in the Center for Cardiovascular Regeneration and Anahita Mojiri, uh, who is a postdoc with me. Dr. Mojiri is from Canada and uh, has been working in my laboratory now for about a year. So we're going to talk now about uh, vascular aging. We, we ended the last segment talking about uh, the hemodynamic effects on the, on the vessel wall. And we were just starting to talk a little bit about uh, cellular senescence. Um, and vascular aging. And I think I'm, I'm going to turn to Jacques. Dr. O'Hayan is a, an expert in mechanobiology, and he has studied one of the uh, major problems that occur with vascular aging, and that is vascular stiffness. Can you tell us a, a little bit, Dr. O'Hayan, about uh, vascular stiffness and how it's measured? Yes, um, the vascular stiffness is a very important index in clinics. Uh, clinicians usually use uh, what they call the compliance or distensibility of the vessel. Uh, the way they do that is from, from imaging technique, they are able to observe the change, the variation of cross-sectional area of an artery with regard to this is, they have this variation, they divide by the variation of pressure and they get some number which is the compliance. Mm -hmm. uh, smaller is this number, stiffer will be the vessel. So, so it's w what you're looking at is the change in the vessel diameter with the pulsatile pressure. Correct. Uh, and so this is pressure, uh, uh, volume, change uh, gives you compliance. Yes, it's, let's say compliance is more surf area change since mm -hmm. we Area are going, going to see a cross-section. But what usually clinicians for, forget is that this index, this uh, clinical index, the compliance, account for two things. They account for the stiffness of the wall, but they account also for, for the, uh, the, 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 the thickness of the artery wall. Mm -hmm. That means stiffness and thickness. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say, take an example. You have two uh, uh, arteries made of the same media, mm -hmm. which, which, which is with the same stiffness, mm -hmm. but one is, stiffer, is thicker than the other. Mm -hmm. Then the compliance of the thicker vessel will be lower than the compliance of the mm -hmm. thinner vessel. Yeah, makes sense. It's like the difference between a, yes. a balloon and a tire, for example. Exactly. If you have a thicker wall, it, uh, you it need more pressure exactly, to distend that. Exactly. But that means it's not direct relationship between the wall thickness, the wall stiffness, and the compliance is not direct. Mm -hmm. We must uh, know that there is a geometry effect. In mm -hmm. it. So, so um, that that being said, what what happens with aging? What when 
w to the blood vessel compliance? What I knew from aging is that it's on everyone knows about uh, the, the stiffness of the wall increase with, with age, which means the compliance decreased. Mm -hmm. And, um, but which is more important, the compliance is, has been used by the team of uh, Matthias Tuber, Alison A. and Weiss from John Hopkins Baltimore mm -hmm. to, uh, to see how these parameters change. They, had, they, they took three populations, the normal one, the population with light artery, coronary artery disease, mild, and another population with severe coronary mm -hmm. artery disease. And what they found, they found that the compliance dropped by a factor two when they compared the normal to uh, the coronary artery disease, putting all together the patient with coronary artery disease. Mm -hmm. They also define another index, which I think a very elegant way. It's a vasodilatation index. Mm -hmm. And uh, just by, uh, they use MRI, they ask the patient to do an isometric hand grip. Mm -hmm. And they are able to see, just by doing this exercise, the coronary vasodilate and they measure the change of cross-section before the exercise and during the exercise. Mm -hmm. And what which gives you the capability of the, of the vessel to vasodilate. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the change in percent was around 20% for the normal population, the change of change of area for the vasodilatation, for the control. And for the mild coronary artery, what I believe is could be similar to what happened in aging, uh, drop to zero. There is no change anymore of vasodilatation mm -hmm. when the, with mild coronary patient with mild coronary artery. But more interestingly, for patient with severe coronary artery disease, there is a reverse result. That means you have a constriction of mm -hmm. the vessel. Yeah. That means if you take these two uh, uh, index compliance on vasodilatation, they are defined. Uh, you could have a very good diagnosis of prediction of their disease mm -hmm. of pathology. So let's tease that apart a little <laughs> bit. Um, y we, we talked about, uh, the, you, talk, you just talked about vascular stiffness increasing. The more coronary artery disease you have, the stiffer your vessel tends to be. That's one. So let's talk about the other uh, uh, for a moment. Uh, you mentioned that with uh, more coronary artery disease, you have less vasodilation, and that was as assessed by M MRI, you could, they, I, that's quite amazing. You could actually see changes in vessel diameter based on something that the subject was doing, doing this forearm uh, isometric grip. Uh, you could see a vasodilation in a normal subject, but no vasodilation at all in someone who had mild coronary disease and a vasoconstriction exactly. in someone who had, right. had severe coronary disease. Uh, it was um, uh, Peter Gantz. Um, many years ago, I think 20 years ago or so, that showed uh, something very similar with acetylcholine infusions directly into the coronary artery. Uh, you, you, you normally get a vasodilation in a healthy person, but in, in someone with coronary artery disease, you get a vasoconstriction. So what, let's talk a little bit about what the altered vasodilation, vasoreactivity that occurs in, in someone with uh, coronary artery disease. Um, what do you think is responsible for that altered vasodilation? In terms of biomechanics, uh, it's a release of tension. If all endothelial cells, uh, or smooth muscle cells, sorry, uh, inside the wall have a residual tension, mm -hmm. which allow you to respond to the vasodilatation very fast. Uh, and, and when this tension is released, then you get normally the vasodilatation response. Mm -hmm. But if the wall is becoming stiffer, then even if you release this tension, the change of area will be minima. Mm -hmm. There is no, this is what, what could happen with aging on, on the, when the, when the artery becomes stiffer. So I'm going to talk, I'm going to turn to Dr. Natule just for a moment to tell us what, what's the mechanism for this release of tension within the vascular smooth muscle that uh, Dr. O'Hein was just talking about. So what do you think is the <coughs> primary so determinant? So <coughs> from what I heard, so it's clear that the role of endothelial cell is very important. Right, because we talk about uh, the release of NO production, which is important for um, vessel relaxation. Mm -hmm. um, and then, f from this point of view, <coughs> I would like to understand your your uh, thought. So, does it mean that in aging, so the role of the endothelial cell dysfunction is critical? Mm -hmm. Right? Can we consider aging is a disease? Yeah. Because this has been a de debate for a very long time. Yeah. Um, so let's break that apart a little bit. So nitric oxide, you think, uh, released yes. from the endothelium is, is a, a major determinant of 
vasodilation, and, yes. and that appears to get become impaired with aging, and right. also with risk factors, cardiovascular risk factors. So, I think it's been been shown now pretty clearly that all of the risk factors that we know contribute to coronary artery disease, high cholesterol, diabetes, etc. Each of those risk factors also impairs the ability of the endothelium to release nitric oxide and impairs vasodilation as you were describing and um, can contribute to the process of atherosclerosis. Um, vascular stiffness is another component of this. So uh, impaired ability to relax and then uh, is, is partly due to the impaired endothelium. But you also mentioned that it, it's the vessel itself has, has some stiffness and it can't, it's, it's more difficult to relax. Tell us, what are the determinants of, the, of that? What causes the vessel to be stiff uh, in addition to the alterations in the endothelium? The vascular, the smooth mus <coughs> vascular smooth muscle cells also secrete so-called extracellular matrix mm -hmm. protein. So that contribute to the stiffness of mm -hmm. you know, the, the vessel wall. So extracellular matrix, alterations in the extracellular matrix contribute to, yes. to stiffness. And also, of course, you know, the accumulation of cholesterol and wasted product due to the process of atherosclerosis that also make the, the vessel wall more stiffened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So multiple determinants. What about cal calcium, calcification? The calcification are very important in the mature plaque. Uh, on, on, uh, in fact, um, they are not responsible for plaque rupture, except that uh, a very recent study of, of Shelley Weber and, uh, from the National Academy of Science on uh, Luis Cordoso uh, showed that microcalcification entity particle, smaller than 5 micron, at the level of the thin cap, could be responsible for a huge accumulation of stress in this thin cap. Mm. And this is a new hypothesis that try to validate, mm -hmm. and they need some higher level of definition of microscopy to, to prove that. And but the big calcification area are not very uh, essential for to predict the plaque rupture. Mm -hmm. I will say they will stabilize mm -hmm. the plaque, but but micro calcification at the level inside the thin cap could be dangerous and could be one of the new, pr new parameters mm -hmm. that we must take care of. Oh, that's interesting. So you're saying microcalcification within the cap could increase stress on the cap exactly. and, and cause that fibrous cap to rupture, <laughs> leading to a heart attack or a stroke. Interesting. Well, you know, um, uh, the calcium score is something that we use quite a bit in cardiology, the CT coronary uh, calcium score. And uh, I, was, I heard a talk uh, just recently by our own Dr. Kurum Nasir, who's joined us from Yale. And uh, he likes to talk about the power of zero. The power of zero, meaning if you have a CT coronary score of zero, you're in good shape, man. You don't have to worry about having a heart attack or stroke. Power of zero. But uh, that, can we actually see, I guess we can't see microcalcification no, with no. the CT scanning. Oh no, we, uh, you need a speci specific system to see that. We cannot see it on in vivo in on, on during the clinical uh, investigation. Yeah. This has been proved uh, post-mortem on, on some sample, um, but these microcalcification are there, there are mm -hmm. it's a reality. Mm -hmm. it's you know, another thing that uh, you can pick up by MR, I know uh, Valentin Fuster and, and others have looked at neovascularization of carotid plaque. Um, have you done any work in, in that arena? Can you tell us a little bit about how you image neovascularization in uh, atherosclerotic plaque? I never did a, some work on neovascularization, but from my discussion I have with Alain Tetgi, which is a, a biologist from France, uh, we, uh, he told me I, uh, that the, uh, one of the main parameters we must be careful about the neovascularization coming from outside the vessel, mm -hmm. going through the um, adventitia until the antima. Mm -hmm. That may be a reason, also one of the factors responsible of the growth of the atherosclerotic plaque. Mm -hmm. It's quite an interesting concept, isn't it? That uh, the plaque is almost like a, a bit like a tumor. It needs its own vascular right. supply. And uh, the, the macrophage within that plaque are making uh, proteins that enhance vessel growth and that plaque growth is, uh, rather the plaque growth is dependent upon uh, vascularity. Um, does vascularity contribute to plaque rupture at all? We plaque don't. Vascular. 
we don't know really uh, it contributes for sure to the growth of the plaque, but we don't know their uh, their influence with regard to the plaque rupture. Mm -hmm. Today we are mainly on biomechanical factor that could be responsible for the plaque rupture. Mm -hmm. Has the morphology, geometry of the uh, elasticity of the different constituents, uh, size of the necrotic core, mm -hmm. size of the thin thin w thin uh, fibrotic wrap. Uh, than all, all this, but it's only morphological parameters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we were talking about uh, extracellular matrix as a cause of vascular stiffness, but um, recently uh, Brandon Walter has some other thoughts about what can cause uh, stiffness. So our, I guess our blood vessels get stiff as we get stiff with aging, uh, but it turns out cells can get stiff too. You have some evidence for that. Tell, yeah. us, tell so us a little bit about that. A lot of this is interesting because it's recent research and we've, we've known for long periods of time that the, the physical architecture of blood vessels plays a role in their phenotype. So like laminar shear stress and disturbed flow, we knew this at a very high up level. Um, but it's only recently that we've started exploring how this works at a cellular level and how a single cell can respond to a mechanical environment. And this, as Dr. Lee was talking about, she studies things at a molecular level. Um, this new research studies transcription factors or proteins or other processes that respond specifically to a mechanical stimuli. And the, the ones that uh, we're looking at recently are called YAP and TAS. They're generally referred to together as YAP TAS. Um, and these are transcription factors that respond directly to a mechanical force. So if you apply a laminar shear to an endothelial cell or if you see disturbed flow, you can actually see YAP TAS do something in response to the mechanical force. And this is really interesting because it's one of the first times we have a biochemical pathway that is directly linked to the physical uh, the physical phenomena or the physical stimulus that we see. Mm -hmm. And Jacques touched on it. Um, this is also called mechanobiology. Uh, so it's sort of, we have different levels at which you can study mechanobiology. But this is a, it's an interesting prospect because now we can see or look at uh, individual cellular disturbances of YAPTAS. Mm -hmm. And as it turns out, um, you can mess with these biochemical pathways and you don't need an external force. You can have internal disturbances mm -hmm. of YAP and TAS. So let's talk about that for a minute. So, so what you're saying is that uh, a cell, like an endothelial cell, can, can respond to forces, physical forces. Mm -hmm. now, it's been known for quite a long time that, that the endothelial cell can respond to shear stress, which is basically the uh, tractive force of fluid flow across the endothelial surface. And then you have cyclic strain, which mm -hmm. is which is the uh, what what the endothelial cell feels as the vessel gets larger and smaller during with pulsatile pressure. But you're saying also that the endothelium uh, or cells in general can sense the environment, can sense the environment around them, the stiffness of the environment. Mm -hmm. So in a stiff, let's say, in a stiff vessel that Jacques was talking about. Endothelial cells can sense that mm -hmm. stiffness. So, tell us, is, is that what, what uh, Yaptaz are doing? They're sensing the physical? Yeah. So, one of the interesting, and this is not a very old study, it was published in Nature in 2016. They showed that Yaptaz responds to laminar shear and substrate stiffness. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, if you knock out the targets that Yaptaz activate when they are activated, in some uh, pathological state, you actually protect from atherosclerotic plaques. Hmm. So if you shut off the genes that YAPTAS turn on, you don't get plaque progression. So YAPTAS, these, these are proteins mm -hmm. that are activated uh, when a cell is in a stiff environment. So mm -hmm. the cell is sensing this stiff environment around it, and YAPTAS get activated, they go to the nucleus, and you say they turn on genes that cause atherosclerosis. Mm -hmm. So this, it sounds like this process can propagate itself. You have yeah. a stiff vessel, and the thial cells don't like a stiff vessel, and they act, uh, activate YAPTAS and activate this inflammatory signaling. 
Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's almost like a vicious cycle because you have disturbed flow and vessel stiffness which activate YAP TAS. YAP and TAS then promote atherosclerosis and then you get more disturbed flow, more, va more vascular stiffness, and it's this feed forward mechanism until eventually you develop plaques. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's an interesting prospect because what it tells us is we can actually look at individually, you know, what does one cell sense when, um, when it's in, you know, some, some flow field or another physical phenomenon. Um, and I think one of the most exciting parts of mechanobiology is now we're able to finally study biochemically a physical phenomena. Um, and we have a target that sort of links the pathway between all the genes that we knew were up, up regulated and down regulated. So sort of the, the, the common inflammatory cytokines that we all are really familiar with in the presence of disturbed flow, um, this pathway serves as the link between the two of them. Mm -hmm. um, but also in addition to that, uh, you can have cells dysregulate this sort of from the inside out. And we've known this as well for a long time, that as a cell ages, it also loses the ability to sense things mechanically. So like aged cells are a lot larger. Uh, if you look at the endothelium, aged cells also don't really align with flow very well. Mm -hmm. And these are interesting because it, it happens at the cellular level. So it's a single cell that is sort of losing the capacity to sense things mechanically. Um, so older cells don't respond very well to hemodynamic forces. They, Absolutely. They, they lose that capacity to align themselves with the flow of blood, for example, in a vessel, vessel wall. Mm -hmm. You've been doing some work. We've talked about how stiffness can affect the, the cell, but you have some recent data suggesting that cells themselves can become stiff. Tell us a little bit about right. that. So as cells age, um, there is a protein expressed, and I share this protein because it's one of the ways we can study vascular aging um, in the context of, uh, of pathology, but as cells age, their mechanics change. And in the context of what I study, I study it in the context of progeria. Mm -hmm. So progeria is a rapid aging disease, and most of these kids pass away from heart attack mm -hmm. uh, at a very early age. And this is because they express a mutant protein called progerin. This progerin protein alters the mechanical properties of the cell. So the cells overall have a changed morphology, so they are flatter. And they're also stiffer from when we measure composite stiffnesses. Mm -hmm. And this is very interesting because this is an internal deficit. This is an internal mechanical deficit of these cells, and it causes them to age rapidly. Mm -hmm. So, sort of. So, I guess you're studying progeria because this is a, a model mm -hmm. for accelerated aging, mm -hmm. and uh, these children with uh, progeria have this abnormal nuclear lamin, mm -hmm. um, and that abnormal nuclear lamin, you're saying it, it alters the the structure of the nucleus of the cell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so when you look at these progeria cells and you put them in like a flow field or you put them on softer substrates, they behave just like aged cells. They're very, very big, uh, they don't align, and they essentially can't even acknowledge that there's some beneficial physical force there. Mm -hmm. So laminar shear doesn't help them. Um, and the, the hallmark of this is that it's an internal deficit mm -hmm. and it mirrors aging. So to sort of put together this paradigm of how does, you know, how do cells age from the inside out, we sort of called it mechanical aging. Mm -hmm. This phenomenon that the cell itself can age and change in its mechanical properties. How do you measure that? How do you measure stiffness of a cell? So we can actually do it directly using atomic force microscopy. It's a very, very small little cantilever. Um, it works j just the same as you would measure something big uh, and measure its stiffness, but um, it's, uh, it's sort of like at a very mini scale and we can go down to each cell individually and just poke them. And based on how far they deform when we poke them and other properties that we can measure, uh, that tells us how their mechanical properties change. That's and fascinating. So you do this little atomic force microscopy, you actually push on the cell. Yeah. And, and if it deforms a lot, well, that indicates it's compliant. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a healthy cell. But if, it's, if it doesn't respond much to your prodding, then it's uh, stiff and it's aged, yeah. is what you're saying. Let's talk about this, this disease of progeria for a moment. Um, 
uh, Anahita Mojiri, who's on my right, has been studying uh, progeria vascular cells. And the reason she's doing that is because these children die from heart attack and stroke, as you mentioned earlier, Brandon. And you want to know what's wrong with the vascular cells. How, how, how are these kids dying of a uh, heart attack and stroke at the age of 13, 14, or 15? What's, what's gone wrong with their vascular cells? Can you tell us a little bit about that, Dr. Mojiri? Um, as uh, Brandon briefly mentioned, the, this syndrome starts from the single mutation in lamin A. So abnormal lamin A, or uh, as it's called, uh, progerin, will permanently bring a furnace related part. So it will locate in the nuclear uh, envelope, but nuclear that's supposed to be nice and round, now it's folded. So basically the structure of the nuclear were disrupt and... So you're saying the progerin accumulates in the nuclear envelope? Yes, and that uh, at the level of, uh, at the molecular level, cause a global change in gene expression. And children, as you mentioned, are uh, suffering from uh, skeletal dysplasia, lipotrophy, and more importantly, cardiovascular disease. And so I guess that it does make sense. I mean, if you're deforming the nuclear envelope and changing the genomic architecture, you're going to cause changes in gene expression, yes. which can cause all, all kinds of problems for these children. Yes. And, uh, but what they uh, die from is, is their vascular disease. Yes. And it's interesting because um, this uh, progeria syndrome uh, become uh, as a premature aging because become a model of a studying aging because all of us also express progerin to some extent as we are aging. But really, so yes. we all accumulate some amount of progerin. Yes, so this, what you're l l learning uh, with these the cells from these children could be applicable to all of us. Exactly, and that's why it's important to understand how how this happens at the uh, cellular level and is it possible to reverse this aging in mm -hmm. the cells, especially in vasculature. So, for example, one hallmark of aging is uh, telomere erosion. So, telomeres are um, specific repetitive uh, hexonucleotide at each uh, end of the chromosome, a linear chromosome. Mm -hmm. So, and their length is around 10 to 15 kb. They are very important in uh, genome stability. So what they do at each end of the chromosome, they make a loop, they fold the DNA, and they recruit a special uh, complex of the protein called the um, sheltering. So together, they protect each end of the chromosome from DNA damage response. So it sounds like the telomere is, is, uh, at, the, is at the tip of the chromosome. It's almost like the tip of a shoelace yes. uh, protecting that uh, that lace from, from un unwinding, from fraying. Yes, uh, so exactly. It's very interesting because they are biological timekeeper. So it's more, uh, we can measure the um, biological age by measuring the telomere uh, lengths. It could be more uh, precise than what is, uh, is registered in birth certificate, actually. Uh -huh. So what, what causes the telomeres to erode? You say the telomeres are biological timekeepers, and the, it, it, they, they get shorter over time. What yes. causes them to become shorter over time? So um, uh, somatic cells, they divide. Every time that they divide, uh, the telomere lose um, something between 50 to 100 base per. That is naturally happens. And so they get, as they divide, the telomere lengths get shorter and shorter and shorter. When a telomere critically is short, so cells cannot divide anymore. So it is start to become senescent or apoptosized, they die. And this, this is natural, this happens by aging, but there are some specific events that could increase the speed of that erosion, for example, inflammation, for example, oxidative stress, when the damage in the cells is more than the cells could deal with and clear the damage. That's interesting. So, so you're saying inflammation can cause telomere erosion. And well, a lot of the things that we we're talking about today, uh, diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, all of those things can activate inflammatory signaling. So do all of those things also cause telomere erosion? Yes, exactly. And so it means it could be, it, hap it could be like a locally, just for the endothelial cells. For people who smoke, it could be just in the uh, lung, but it could be also systemically. For these children, it's systemically. Oh, that's, that's interesting. So there are, there are, you're 
saying that there can also be sites of focal senescence where exactly. we age faster. So if you're a smoker, it may be your lungs that are aging faster. If you're exactly. out in the sun, it's your skin that's aging faster. And this is all related to, uh, in part at least, to telomere erosion. That's true. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you may ask that, uh, so how we can rescue this phenomena? Well, before we talk about that, what does it mean? What, what does telomere erosion mean to the cell, the vascular cells of these kids? What is that, how does that accelerate vascular aging? What, what happens to these cells that have shorter telomeres? When they have a shorter telomeres, it means that they are aged. So when the vasculature are aged, as Brandon mentioned, they cannot respond properly to the shear. And so they induce atherosclerosis. And this happens not just in these children. By aging, it happens for all of us. So if we could rescue the aging effect, if we can rejuvenate the cells, the vasculature mm -hmm. of these children, we could extend the mm -hmm. lifespan for these children. You've got the uh, cells from these children. Uh, you're looking at them. What, how are they different from, from normal vascular cells? They are very different because when telomeres get shorter, and these children have a very short telomeres, they can't divide anymore. So they have a very slow rate of uh, proliferation. We, we, when we compare them uh, in vitro, uh, the normal cells grow uh, nicely, like a nice curve of growth. But these um, cells, these progeria cells, they have a very poor and uh, low level of uh, proliferation. But, and, and that's one effect, uh, one phenomena which is very obvious. And also because of the increased inflammation in these cells, we have lots of uh, senescent associated uh, uh, secretory uh, proteins, which it's called SA. P, S A S P, uh, because they are very really inflamed. So S A S P is this phenomenon where the cells make a lot more of an inflammatory molecules. Yes, yes, and uh, so this is what is uh, being studied, uh, and if we can reduce the inflammatory markers, if we can extend the telomere uh, lengths, we can eventually rescue the fun the function and the uh, morphology of these cells. Mm -hmm. That's that's exciting. Um, I think that uh, we're coming to the end of our time here um, at the uh, cutting edge of cardiovascular sciences, and I want to thank my guests, uh, Anahita Mojiri, uh, who is a postdoc in the Center for Cardiovascular Regeneration, Dr. Natu Lee, Associate Professor of Cardiovascular Sciences, and Jacques Ohain, who's visiting us from uh, the Savoie Mont Blanc in Grenoble, France and uh, also our own MD, PhD student, Brandon Walter. Thank you guys for joining Thank us you. today. Really uh, interesting discussion. I think we should uh, have another one, uh, uh, focus on aging, uh, hallmarks of aging. We got a little bit into the telomeres, but there are a lot of other determinants of aging that we, we can talk about uh, next time at the next show. Thank you. Well, thank you all for joining us. I'm your host, John Cook, Chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences at the cutting edge of cardiovascular science uh, here at Houston Methodist DeBakey CV Education. Thank you.